I love the sea. I'm an old fisherman, and I've always loved the sea. I love the sound of the waves as they lap up on the shore. I love the sound of the gulls as they swoop and soar overhead. I love to watch the fishermen struggling with their nets full of fish, dragging them onto their boats. I love it when storms blow in at night and whip the water into a fury. I love the sea. It brings back so many memories for me. My name is John, and I was exiled to this island called Patmos by men who fear the name of Christ and wanted to keep me from preaching his gospel. But little did they know that it was not they who sent me here, but him. I spend most of my days, when I can, walking the rocky beach, remembering, praying. And I spend a lot of my time sitting right here, writing. And I write because I see things. Rather, he shows me things, and he tells me to write them down. And I write because he gives me words to express things too wonderful for me to imagine. I met him some 70 years ago when I was just a young man. My brother and I ran the family fishing business in Galilee. Nothing big. We had a couple of boats and some, uh, some nets and a few guys who worked for us. But it was our living. The sea was our life. And all that changed the day Jesus came near our boat. We were preparing the nets for just another day of fishing, and he walked up close enough to our boat for us to hear him, and he hollered out to us, Hey, you guys ever get tired of fishing? <laughs> and I laughed to myself. I said, Ah, teacher, you should try it sometime. we got to get you on our boat. See, we knew who Jesus was by then. He was the carpenter from Nazareth who had become a preacher of sorts, kind of a traveling rabbi. He'd been in our town for several weeks, preaching to anyone who would stop to listen. He said that the kingdom of God was about more than keeping the religious laws of our people. He said it was about a righteousness that came from the heart. That it was about loving your neighbor, even loving your enemy. He said the kingdom of God is about being born again. And it didn't make any sense to me the first time I heard it. But he spoke with a kind of conviction and passion that was just contagious. And people were starting to listen. I was starting to listen. So at that day, after I teased him about getting on our boat, he looked at us and he said in a different tone of voice, Come, guys, follow me, he said, and I will make you fishers of men. I can't tell you how many times over the years people have asked me, was that it? Is that all he said, they would ask? That you left your father, you left your boats, you left your nets, you left the men who worked for you for that? <laughs> and my answer is always the same. I say, yes and no. See, my brother and I were fishermen. And we were fishermen because our father Zebedee was a fisherman and his father before him. We were fishermen, in a sense, because we couldn't do anything else. You see, in our culture, uh, it, only the smartest boys were invited to go further in school. And they became doctors or teachers or rabbis. The rest of us just went into the trades our fathers taught us. Now, don't get me wrong. We weren't ashamed of what we did. We worked hard. We ran a good business. But in our culture, that was the end of the line for us. We really couldn't go any further. So guys like Peter and Andrew and my brother and myself, we were fishermen because we were not invited to go further in school. But then Jesus came along. And in our eyes, he was a kind of holy man, a rabbi. We called him teacher. And something here you have to understand. When a young man has studied enough and gone far enough in school and understood enough of the Holy Scriptures and thought he was ready to become what we call a Talmudim, a, a disciple of a rabbi, he had to go to his rabbi and ask him a question. He had to go to him and ask, may I follow you? Which is a way of saying, do you think I have what it takes to become like you? And if the rabbi said yes, it meant that the rabbi thought the student could be like him. And it was the highest honor any young man could receive. So, Imagine what it was like for us 
to have Jesus come to our boat. I mean, we were just ordinary men. We had not been invited to continue our studies. We could never have become Talmudim in our wildest dreams. So to have him come invite us to follow him, to be his disciples, to become his Talmudim meant that the rabbi thought we could be like him. So yes, yes, we left our nets to follow him, but it wasn't on a whim. It was because he saw more in us than we saw in ourselves. So I spent almost three years with him. Three years that seemed like 30. Three years that seemed like just three weeks. I saw him do things that even to this day, when I talk about them, sound just crazy. I was there the day he fed 5,000 or more people out of one little boy's sack lunch. I was there the day that he called his friend Lazarus out of the tomb from death to life by calling his name and then said, I am the resurrection and the life. But my favorite stories about Jesus, as you could expect, were the ones where he was on the boat with us. There was this one time. He'd been teaching crowds all day long and just wanted to get away for peace and quiet like he often did. And so he said, let's go to the other side of the lake. Now, we didn't think that was such a great idea. It was already toward the end of the day, already evening, and we just had that fisherman's hunch that a storm might be on the way. Plus, a night crossing was always a little more dangerous anyway. But he insisted. So we got the boat ready, and we head out on the water. He grabbed a cushion, went to the back of the boat, and fell asleep almost immediately. By the time we got about halfway across, uh, the wind had started to blow, and the sea had started to turn angry, and it was exactly what we were afraid of, uh, a storm in the middle of the night. Uh, we had seen enough strong men and enough fishing boats wind up at the, at the bottom of the lake at night to know we should be afraid. And this wasn't just an ordinary storm. This was a killer. Uh, we were doing everything we could to get water out of the boat, but we kept taking on more. And Peter, who wasn't afraid of anything, finally was afraid. He shouted out, get the teacher, we're going to go down. I yelled back into the wind, but he's sleeping. He said, then wake him up. So I struggled to the back of the boat, and there he was, head on a cushion, sleeping like a baby. It was incredible. I shook him by the shoulder, teacher, 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 wake up, wake up. And when he opened his eyes and sat up, he had a strange look on his face, and I couldn't tell whether he was annoyed or amused or just still kind of sleepy. I said, we're in trouble here. We're going down. How can you be sleeping? And he looked at me with kind of a hint of a smile, and then he turned at the back of the boat and looked out at the storm. And I heard him, and all he said was, hush. Hush, be still. In the kind of voice you would use to shush a toddler. And as I stand here before you tonight, within a few seconds, the wind died down and the sea grew calm and then went like glass. We were standing there, sopping wet, exhausted, mouths hanging open, I'm sure, and he turned around with a big smile and said, why were you so afraid? Where is your faith, he said. I wish I could describe to you what I felt. Relief? awe, a kind of terror. My whole body was covered with goosebumps, and all I could think was, what kind of man is this who speaks to the wind and the waves, and they obey him? None of us said out loud what we were all thinking. In the Psalms, we read, you rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Could it be? There were so many other stories. I've often thought that if I tried to write even half of them down, I could probably write a thousand books. But even more than the stories, I have to tell you about Jesus himself. It's hard to put into words, but he loved us. He loved me. And because he loved me, I loved him. He said things like, as the Father has loved me, so do I love you. So love one another. He loved all of us. He loved Matthew, the tax collector. He loved Judas, the one who ended up... It's a different story. That's why it's so hard for me to understand why they hated him so. By they, I mean certain members of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin. It seemed like the more popular Jesus got, the more they seemed to resent him and look for reasons to critique his ministry. 
Once we came upon a blind man uh, sitting by the side of the road begging. And I asked him the question that has always kind of troubled me. I said, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? I had always just assumed that maybe his blindness was just some sort of punishment from God. But then Jesus said, neither, but that you will see the work of God, he said. And then he spit on some dirt on the ground. He made a muddy kind of paste. He rubbed it on the man's eyes and told him to go wash off in a pool. And when the man came out of the water, he could see. It was a miracle. But the most amazing thing to me wasn't that the man could see who was once blind. It was the response of the religious authorities. They got angry really angry. They actually accused Jesus of violating Sabbath law. I thought, really? They tried to get the man to recant his story. I thought, really? You hate him so much that you can't even take joy in a blind man receiving his sight? Who really are the blind men here? I thought. Well, I won't go through the whole story because I think you know most of it. But those who hated him eventually got him arrested on wildly trumped-up charges, uh, got, uh, actually convinced the Roman governor to accuse him uh, as a threat to Rome, convict him of treason, and then they condemned him, and they put him to death. I actually stood at the foot of the cross the day he died. I stood there with his mother. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my whole life standing next to her as she watched her son die. For no mother should ever watch a child die, especially not like that. But at one point he looked down and said, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to me, Behold your mother. I assumed that what he meant was that since none of his brothers were following him at the time, that he was choosing me to care for his mother. And so I did for the rest of her life. I think, looking back, it was his way of loving both of us. Well, after he died, we all ran and hid. We were in shock. We were sad. We were scared. They had killed him. We thought maybe we were next. And then came Sunday morning. The women had gone to properly anoint his body for burial. There had not been time on that evening since the Sabbath had begun. But then they came back shortly after, all talking and jabbering and weeping and laughing all at once. It was kind of incoherent. Something about his body not being there, messengers dressed in white. Uh, we couldn't make heads or tails of what they were saying. We thought they were just uh, maybe hysterical, overcome with sadness. We didn't know what. But we thought we should go check it out just, if nothing else, to put everything to rest. So Peter and I left. We ran together to reach the tomb. I got there first and saw that the stone indeed was rolled away. It was just kind of weird. I didn't expect that. So I stopped at the entrance to the tomb and looked inside, and I could see the, the linen sheet that they would have wrapped his body in on Friday afternoon. But the women were right. His body was not there. Only the sheet was there. And Peter arrived shortly after, but he pushed right by me and went into the tomb himself. In a few moments, he said, Hey, look here! And I went in too, and he had found the the, the shroud, the napkin that would have been put on his head as they laid him in the tomb. He actually held it up. and We could see on the shroud the markings from the blood, from the wounds in his head and face. And that was when I remembered what he said at Lazarus' tomb. When he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And that was when I began to understand. That was when I believed he had risen. He had risen just as he told us he would. We just hadn't understood all the way along. It happened just as the prophets had said. And Isaiah says, he, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. By his wounds we are healed. Later that same day, he came to us just as he said he would. We sat around a table and we had a bread, we had bread in the cup, just as we had a few days before. He explained everything to us, how everything had to happen just the way it did. And a few days after that, he met us again at the shore of the lake, where he waited and he cooked fish for us for breakfast, just like he had always done. And then, a few days after that, he left us. But before he left us, he told us two things. 
First, he promised to send us his spirit to be with us, to give us strength. And then he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, he said. Well, that was a long, long time ago. After Jesus left us, we just went about doing what he told us to do. We just told the story. We preached and preached how God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, as the final sacrifice for our sins, and that whoever believed in him would have eternal life. We had no idea what we were doing. We didn't know what would happen next. We just told the story over and over again. And you know what? Seeing all of you here tonight tells me he was right. He did make us into fishers of men. Then over the next 20 years or so, one by one, they were all taken away from us. Most of them martyred by enemies of the cross. Most of them taken away for preaching his name. Peter, Andrew, even James, the Lord's brother. Those of us who were left just kept on preaching, and his church continued to grow in numbers and in strength all over the world. And for some reason, he saw fit to keep me alive all these years. Exiled to this island, yes, but not martyred like so many others. And I used to wonder why. Why me? But as I've grown older, I've come to understand why. He wanted me to keep telling the story, but he just wanted me to do it in a different way. He wanted me to write. He wanted me to tell it with my pen and my parchment. And so I write. I write because he shows me things. Sometimes when I sleep, sometimes when I pray, sometimes when I'm wide awake and looking out at the sea. And what I see is Jesus. Not as he was, not as I knew him, but as he is now. One day, I watched as a great storm rolled in, and the crowds were, clouds were churning like a great army of stallions riding into battle. And he said to me, write, and I wrote. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, in our world, a king would often ride into a conquered city on a white horse as a symbol of his power and authority. And I remembered that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he rode on a donkey, which was the symbol of great humility. And now he was showing me that the next time I see him, he will ride not on a donkey, but on a great white horse. He will be coming not in humility, but in power and glory to take back all that rightfully is his. He'll be coming to conquer. And I thought of the people I knew. I thought of Stephen. As the stones cast by wicked men rained down on his head, the first brother to be martyred. And I thought of my great friend Peter, crucified upside down, for preaching his name. And I thought about the rider on the white horse who was coming to make all things right again. And then sometimes in the evening, the sea goes still as glass. The setting sun turns the surface into kind of shimmering diamonds in my eyes, and he says, write. And I write. In front of the throne, there was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings. And day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And as I write, I think, He is the Eternal One. That's why He could speak to the wind and the waves. He was the one who created them in the first place. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. He took on flesh and dwelled among us. Now He sits on the throne of heaven, worshipped by creatures too glorious for words. And sometimes when I see the flocks of gulls swirling overhead, the fluttering white wings remind me of a flowing white bridal gown, and he says, right. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. And as I write, I remember, 
I remember that wedding feast so long ago where the wine ran short. I was sitting right next to him when his mother came to him and said that the host of the party needed his help. He said, it's not my time. And she insisted, as mothers will often do. So he told the servants to fill some large stone jars with water. And I thought to myself, water? What for? They need wine. And then I watched as the head waiter dipped a cup into the stone jar and took a sip. And I'll never forget the look on his face. Wine. Not just any wine, but the finest wine. And not just enough for the party, enough for the whole village. And the dancing and singing continued far into the night. And now he was showing me what the celebration will be like that's called the wedding supper of the Lamb. He is the groom, and we, the church, are his bride. The table is ready, and the wine will never run out because the joy will never end. And then I remember when I first saw him. Just the carpenter from Nazareth come to our town. And I heard the Baptist say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And I didn't understand what he was talking about, but now I do. And he says, Right. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Because of Jesus... Because of his cross, we no longer sacrifice animals, for he is the lamb. He is the final lamb to be sacrificed. He is the lamb of God, and his blood is what cleanses us from all sin. So now, after all these years, I know. I know why he brought me to this island. I know why I've spent my days watching the sea and the sky. He wanted to show me who he is and what is to come. He wanted me to write. He is not only the one who healed the blind man. He is the king of heaven. He is not only the one who calmed the storm. He is the lamb that was slain. He is not only the one who taught us to love our neighbors. He is the eternal word who created the heavens and the earth, who redeems all things and will rule forever over the new heaven and new earth. He is not only the humble one who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, but he is the king, the conquering one who rides on the white horse, coming to judge the living and the dead. He is not only the one who died on a Roman cross, but the one who is risen and coming again. Before he left us, he said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you where I am. And this is what he has shown me in so many visions. That is the holy city. That place is the new Jerusalem. The place where there will be no more pain, no more tears, no more crying, and no more death. A place where we will laugh and dance and serve and rule with him forever and ever. I know that now I am not long for this earth. I know that my time is near. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. He has shown me that this old world will not last forever. There will be tribulation, there will be suffering, and there will be an end. There will be an end for me. And dear friends, there will be an end for you. But I know this. I know he loved me. And he died for me. And I know he loves you and died for you. And I know he rose again and that he lives today. And I know that he sits on the throne of heaven. And all the angelic beings and creatures that bow before him tremble with anticipation for the day that trumpet will sound. For on that day he promised. He promised to come for me and for you. And for all those who believe in his name. So now I wait. I wait and I watch. And I wait with patience and longing and great hope because I know, I know he's coming again. Come. Come, Lord Jesus.